there's a lot of climate activists, there are a lot of youth that are really, um, really rising up and, and saying enough is enough. And, and part of that is the, the tension against the corporations and the, the, the generations that are holding the, the current status quo. Um, and part of that is, you know, developing new, new thinking, new systems, new communities, new language even of how we're going to, to future, um, how we're going to lean in and move into that future, right? Kind of thinking of it as like shining a flashlight and figuring out, you know, what's probable, what's plausible and, and, and what's possible and, and really leaning into um, the, the, the decisive factors that we can have a locus of control around. Leon Wang is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Leon, or Wang Li Zong, is genderqueer, Taiwanese, second generation American, they, them, he, kin, who is able-bodied with an invisible neurodiverse ability. In essence, they are auto-catalyzing connector, exploration facilitator, and network weaver. At heart, he is an extreme generalist that is creating conduits towards by-rider futures. Leon leverages deep expertise and life-centered design, nat nature-inspired creativity, emerging technologies, and justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, which stands for JEDI. So should you hear me or Leon say JEDI, you'll know what that means. Justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. To amplify change agents to create and, and involve more optimal and well-adapted solutions. In the last six years, Leon has engaged deeply in diverse doings with trailblazing organizations like Sustainable Ocean Alliance, Buck Minister Fuller Institute, 1.5, Singularity University, Biomimicry 3.8, Starting Block, Playground of Empathy and Rethink that are all thought leaders in the impact space. Leon is a certified biomimicry professional with an MS biomimicry from ASU, Arizona State University, and a Bachelor of Science in Bioengineering from UCSD. Leon is bravely shifting our dreaming, knowing, being, and doing in this world to be more people positive, complexity conscious, and life liberating. As an anti-bias, anti-racist, intersectional environmentalist, they also strive to bring awareness to critical unlearning of systems of oppression. In radical brave spaces, he invites attention, intention, and repetition towards active shaping of more just, equitable, and diverse and inclusive Jedi futures for all life. Leon, welcome to the podcast. It's so great that you're here. Thank you, Mark, for that lovely introduction. Um, that is the, the bio that I've been throwing around all over the place uh, as I start to weave my own identity and how I talk about myself. Obviously, speaking as very much an extreme generalist myself and you as well, um, there's just so many pieces to ourselves, so many multifaceted um, grooves, shall we say, to our human being that uh, you know, words are never enough. And so we're here in conversation just for that. Um, and so super grateful for the time we get to spend here and also um, everyone else listening through deep time and expansive space to connect and thread um, what we're about to, yeah, weave together. I really appreciate it. I love your background and thank you for throwing up the emojis as we speak. Um, uh, you, you really have this nice, Techno lust a little bit. You're very technologically savvy, but you're very mm -hmm. grounded in uh, the symbiotic earth and in the um, our spaceship earth is truly your home that you're mm -hmm. truly connected to. We can 
hear that through your bio, but also uh, uh, sense that in, in what you've done and your path, not only in your educational path. I want to start out right with a bang and, wow. and get into um, some, some uh, uh, craziness that the whole world's been experiencing this past 12 plus months that we've been living in the pandemic. Black Lives Matter, people of color, Asian racism, um, the inauguration, oh my God, let's not forget that craziness, and um, all the other uh, absurd, extremely crazy things going on in our world in, during this time that we need to take respect for, but also have really shooken the entire planet in a big way. And you've been... <laughs> on this path and you're you're not old grandpa like me but you are you have definitely um put in the time to get your education with some great institutions and and done some wonderful things uh, um up until this point uh really love singularity university i love biomimicry 3.8 you know um that i had mark um Dorfman on on the podcast as well from biomimicry 3.8 and uh you're you're a fan or somehow connected to ada paris who's also been on the show and i've had other guests who've also been on singularity on the show this path and this education has opened your eyes and i'm sure there's been tons of learning lessons in that process to really how the world works how okay um technology works and um i i would hope that you've seen some better models for life and, and i'm sure you have but has any of that helped you to weather this crazy time are you saying man we're just repeating the same mistakes that my forefathers my parents my relatives experienced uh and how have you weathered and are there any learning lessons that you can share with us, things that really were aha moments or even even if you don't mind, sad, sad moments uh, um, where you also maybe had a learning lesson? Mm, yeah, oh, Mark, what a wonderful question to, to start us off and not necessarily with a bang, but really just really recognizing the reality and, and rooting where we are now, um, where we've been this last it's been over a year, about 15 months, um, right? Kind of the state of the world. Um, I've always loved the term anthropause. So speaking of Anthropocene, but we're, we're really just um, at a standstill because our systems, our, our communities um, just weren't ready for this. And, and I won't say all because some, some were, some managed and adapted accordingly, but primarily across the board, um, it has been quite the last 15 months of just multiple, multiple um, crises, right? Kind of global crises, whether it's uh, COVID itself for public health, whether it is um, the social uprisings, which none of which are new, but a lot of people are coming to recognize and realize and participate than before um, to, you know, climate change. A lot of our sea level rising, um, the wildfires here in California, there's just been so much more, I think, awareness and mindfulness. And, and I'm wishing that there's a lot more of a paradigm shift individually as well as you know collectively. Um, but yeah, to bring it back to myself and my own story, uh, there's it's been quite a year. I actually, you know, speaking of the love for Singular University, it was a wonderful community to be a part of, um, but I did uh, leave the company not of my own desire, because we had multiple ways of, of, of a reduction in force. So starting off of January, 2020, um, that was when I moved back home to my family in Southern California and um, the pandemic hit. So that was really, in my opinion, a blessing in disguise because what a gift it is to be back home with my parents and to be supportive of each other. What a gift it is to have spaciousness and empty space to adapt and figure out and turn inward um, how I want to be for myself, how I want to be for my communities, for the connected network that I have across the world, and everything flocked to the internet. So I think I just got exposed to so much more than I could ever dream of. Um, 
and was doing major projects with biomimicry uh, folks, was doing a lot of community holding of innovators space. So shout out to Monica Kang from Innovators Box. Um, shout out to people of the global majority and the outdoors, nature and environment, PGM1 for holding space, liberative space um, for all BIPOC people who love, love nature. Um, and really imagining you know, my own future and kind of incubating in that sense. But um, as with everyone else, I think I burned out. I probably burned out probably towards September of last year. Um, really could have took a deep dive, I think. A mix of just everything that I was doing at once, but also not paying attention to what I was missing, right? Like the connection, the presence, being with others beyond just my parents, which they're lovely, but they're my parents. So I love you, mom and dad. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And just wanting and yearning for for a lot that that I wasn't able to get access to for for the sake of you know our safety and and our health um, and so I think I recognize I rationalize a lot of that as wanting to be protective of my parents but really what I was doing was I was trading my own you know personal health for theirs and the promise of theirs and so there's this balance I think for all of us of um, those boundaries and really understanding that so. I went through a pretty depressive period from September to March. That was kind of my, um, one of my lowest points, I would say, uh, just not really understanding my own brain chemistry and how difficult it was to get out of that. Um, I knew where I was at, I knew how to get out of it, but I just didn't have the, the necessary like motivation or energy or intentions to do it. Um, and it had nothing to do with my identity or what was going on. I was very privileged to be you know, in a safe place, um, not have to worry about finances, not have to worry about a lot of other things. And that's already a gift in and of itself. But even then, um, yeah, I think mental health is one of those things that we don't talk about enough, um, especially in the Asian community. And it was hard for me to figure out how to get beyond that. And like I said before, a big piece of it was the brain chemistry. Um, what did lift me out of it was um, at some point, I just reached out to a dear friend uh, from the starting block community and just put out an ask you know they're working for a lovely organization i was like i love and have followed this organization for a year can we make something work i'd love to to engage um, and that led to an interview and a project assignment i think it was that project assignment that really you know with that time bound that intention and and, and um, i love the term sort of urgent optimism to do something i definitely sparked my brain. My brain chemistry came back, you know, a lot of the, the neurochemicals um, probably rewired my brain back to where it needed to be. And that can be myself again. Um, and so really removed that fog. And I would say March is when I kind of um, started my own journey of letting people in. I, I prefer that over the term, like coming out per se of like who I actually am. I mean, sharing a lot of that in full in, in full transparency and full um, desire, not from an ego perspective, but from how this can help catalyze others or, or inspire others and lift others. I, I think recently in the last few months, when people ask me, you know, the age old question, how are you? I usually answer um, just with the metaphor that I feel like I'm at the peak of my life and still climbing. Um, and that's specific to me. But if you ask me the question of like, how are we or how are us all speaking to pronouns that expand you know beyond our ego i feel like there's also the to build on the metaphor i'm not only climbing um, and at that peak but i'm lifting others you know in relation uh, as i climb i am um you know really enjoying the view of what that looks like of, of what our world and the state of our world is there's a lot of calamity and a lot of i think anxiety and negatives, but there's also a lot of beauty and resilience in the face of that. And so for me um, and where I am at in my own view, I think there's just so much to be learned from what it means to be in right relationship. And I say that to, to include everything, right relationship with ourself, right? How, how we talk to ourselves, how we have our own um, you know, inner saboteurs as, as RuPaul might say it, uh, our inner demons, the, the voice that we use, um, which comes from, you know, early childhood, like how we, how parents, how our, our loved ones talk to us, and then how we internalize our own experiences. 
um, to the perspective of you know right relationship with others and each other. You know, speaking to the Jedi perspective, you know, what does that look like, especially in our current systems? And then to our relationship, right relationship to land, waters, you know, nature, our earth, or other more than human beings. Um, and, and kind of that transcendence and understanding what is our relationship to perhaps the stars. I don't know how people want to phrase that, but um, you know, spirituality takes many different names and, and terms, but there's sort of that beyond what we can really truly um measure or know in a sense right i mean as much as i love science i have to recognize the limitations and uh there there is a lot of that and there's a lot of that that i think is just so interesting um to, to unravel and understand so long long answer but i think that kind of gives you just the the real um intentionality and where i've been and why you know now i'm so such a big proponent of talking about mental health, of getting the resources, you know, each of us and all of us need, whether it's individually or in community, um, to process that, um, no matter what it is we're dealing with, because um, I'm a big lover of the individualization perspective, which is to say each of us have gone through our own experiences and a range of emotions, and that is what's created who we are in this moment and who we will be, um, and so to have more awareness and understanding that, you know, speaking to being a very much like a safe person, it's not just the intelligence, there's also the emotional intelligence, there's also, you know, there's so many quotients, right? IQ, EQ, AQ, adaptability quotient, which is very relevant to, to our current times and this new, new world we're constantly evolving into. So yeah, I say all but to say, there's a lot of wisdom out there. Um, there's a lot of wisdom inside of each of us as well. And I think a lot of that in my own journey has been really considering how do I tap into that and how do I honor that um, and how I surface it and integrate it in my own doings um, and self-actualize. And I think that's the, the biggest, the biggest piece. Hey, you brought up a couple of interesting things. First of all, thank you so much for sharing that very intimate and, and uh, look at what you've gone through. And I'm, I'm glad that, uh, in March, uh, things turned, and and uh, are, you're you're doing well, and you've you've found um, a revitalized narrative and story and and, uh, and energy as well. Was that project uh, 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 that you did was that with Rethink or or who was that with? Can you tell us? Um, which which part do you mean the biomimicry projects or? Yeah, the one that you called up your friend and and asked you know what project was, oh, was oh, that, that with Rethink or that's a different one. That was actually in my current workplace home. So um, okay. Martha Cavajos, she previously was full-time staff at Starting Block and then um, moved to work for Sustainable Ocean Alliance. And uh, my reach out was for that organization and that's what landed right. me in my current role. I'm, I'm an associate for the Ocean Solutions Accelerator. And so that's a, a nonprofit really diving deep on Sustainable Development Goal 14, which I'm sure you're familiar with, like below water. Um, and how do we talk about and galvanize you know, solutions for the future of our oceans? Yeah, great. Yeah, I have some friends with Parley TV, and they do a lot with the oceans as well. You've probably heard of them. And, and uh, I think uh, there's, there's a lot that we need to do for the oceans. But I'm, I thank you for telling us about that, that project. Really, uh, there... It, it's really interesting that you you've had that experience and that you had it come you know September to to March kind of in 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 this in this funk that uh, really took you in, in some in in some tough ways. Do you think that there was a lot of outside um, things causing that? You know, you you're pretty good at saying you know a lot of it was with me and things that I needed to do. And, and then you mentioned this, this, this wisdom kind of, and I see us all, I, I love libraries, you know, I love books from my podcast and everybody there, but we're really in this library earth, this, wow. the, the biggest library ever, and it's surrounding us all the time. But it's funny how we can be surrounded by books and wisdom and knowledge and still wow feel lonely still feel health yeah. issues and 
not be able to hear or see. Um, it, it's almost like we're in some respects desensitized or numb or just because of our own health, we just can't see it. It's, it's, um, yeah. Or it's even painful to look and see it there. Were you dealing with any of that at all? Yeah, and talking about my own um, you know, neurochemistry, this is, you know, my depressive period is something that I'm still trying to understand and whether it is kind of a, you know, shifting between a very depressive period versus a very manic period and, and trying to be more aware of what that looks like for my own mental health. Um, I love the term you know, sustainable ambition that I heard from Econa, which is a, a global center for, for entrepreneurial mental wellness. Um, and what does it mean to, to lean into something like that, right? Like to, to, to make sure that we are um, taking care of ourselves as the vessel that is you know, transmuting and is a conduit to all the wonderful ideas, all the things that we do um, in the physical realm, all the things that we dream. Um, our, our real experience of, of knowing and connecting, right? And I think going off of your point, um, it is this feeling that I think to this day and age, we're a species now that is highly disconnected, um, even with all the technology that we have. Uh, I wanna call in some, some words that were shared by me um, through, through Lily Sun, who's another starting blocker um, when I was recently in San Francisco, in the, the land of the Ramatash. Um, people and she told me from her I think elder or someone else that had had passed these words this simple phrase of you know as a human species this is the most primitive age that we're in um, and, I, and I wholly believe that because even with all the technology even with all the privilege and the resources and the abilities that we've amassed um, there has been no time in human history that we've caused um, really the loss of so much life, of so much uh, a, a legacy, you know, of so much liberation, right? I think there's just very mind-boggling to think um, what's the root of all that because, you know, the future is here. We have the solutions. It's just not distributed, you know, to bring in another lovely quote, right? It's not um, fully accessible. And for me, that perspective of, you um, yeah, being in a beautiful library, whether it's looking at nature, because each thing in nature is, you know, a beautiful cornucopia of engineering, of life, of inner workings, and also wisdom, if we're able to really listen to those voices, you know, speaking to the German term, umwelt, you know, each, each self-centered world, each, not just species, but each organism has its own experience, right? Each human is very different in how they experience the world. Um, with, with their wide range of diverse abilities and, and neurodiversity. So there's, there's this perspective, I think, of, and why I'm so fascinated by people and our integration and connection, that's everything, right? Being able to be connected to something and to be able to integrate it. Um, otherwise, what value does it actually have in our individual lives, right? Sort of the whole, you know, if a tree falls in the forest, is anyone actually, no one's around to hear it. You know, did it really fall? Did it make a sound? Um, very, very, very Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's cat as well. Right? Like once we start to measure it, can we really measure it? Can we really actually get there? Um, it's a very fascinating thing and, and why I'm so, and I'm sure you as well, is, is trying to understand, but maybe just be with the mystery and, and be okay with it, not necessarily answered, but um, sitting with it. I think for, for all of us in these dire times, there's just been more time to pause or slow down and yeah, kind of wonder, well, actually, why didn't I notice all this nature around my, my home that I actually really love uh, being with or seeing or witnessing? Um, why didn't I realize how lovely it is to just have a really solid conversation with someone halfway around the world when normally I'm so busy in my day-to-day talking with my you know, cohabitants, with my coworkers, whatever it might be that's place-based. Um, we're finding, I think, more and more connections and threads that have always been there, you know, that they've never left, but we just didn't pay attention to them. We just didn't feel them. Um, and I think that's also true for me and for a lot of people in this time of, of you know, feeling a lot of ancestral trauma, 
um, the recognizing there's also the flip side of that, which is ancestral healing and ancestral strength and ancestral, ancestral wisdom. Um, going off of the words of, of Dr. Ramez. Um, and I think that's a beautiful thing that, that we're now starting to not necessarily lean into a new level of consciousness, but just be more aware and intentional. Um, and I, I try to lean into and encourage that for myself, but also for all the other people that I'm connected or have the privilege and, and gratitude to be connected in conversation and in place or in, in orbit with. So on the profile picture that you provided me for your bio and for your thumbnail, you have a lot of tech on your head and there's a lot yeah. of tech there. And this goes back to what I said earlier is you kind of, you're, you're kind of a techie, you know, technology, you, you've been, you know, at, uh, you've done the studies, but also I'm sure you're experienced in it, but you have this nice balance with, Buckminster Fuller Institute, the Biomimicry 3.8, the Research Assist uh, Assistant of Biomimicry Center, um, you know, on and on that this tie to environment, tie to the earth, tie to looking at materials and nature in a different way. So you, uh, for me, looking outside, and I don't know you well enough, but I, I would say, wow, that's a nice balance. But first of all, explain what in the heck is all that tech on your head? Maybe give us a, give us a dive on that so that when we see the picture, we have a, a little bit better understanding. And then I want after you do that, I want you to kind of explain. So you've got this nice experience, understanding of tech and this extreme uh, knowledge about nature, environment, our world, uh, biomimicry, um, and even though both of those tools, because they, they, they are tools that you had before this happened, um, um, how, how did you get out of it, if you can tell us, or maybe you're still going through that process? Did any of that help? Did any of it make it worse? And were there any learning lessons there as well? And I'll, and I'll caveat why I'm leading you down this way. The entire world, or at least here in Germany, we're, we've been on this curfew, lockdown, you know, extreme. it's been extreme. And people are getting uh, ergonomic issues from working from their couch, yeah. from their bed. You know, they're depressed. They're, have, they're fighting with their spouse. They're strangling oh. their kids. You know, there's all these things going on. Uh, so the future of new work, which we've both been talking about or hearing about for decades, it's changing. It has changed and it will, it will change even more. But that all kind of ties into all the stuff that I just asked you. And so I, I would love to get some more lessons there, if you don't mind. Yeah, thanks for that prompt and, and the curiosity of the, of the tech. It's actually, that was a photo taken by Nick Otto, who was an amazing photographer for us at Singularity University. Um, loved all of his headshots that you probably see a lot of the executives that went through our programs, um, sport on their own websites or LinkedIn's. And uh, the tech that I was wearing at that time was a project that we were doing in the Uncommon Partners Lab at Singularity University, which I was under that team um, with, with uh, uh, yeah, the focus of that was really to think about how do we, you know, going back to the Schrodinger's cat perspective, how do we measure, you know, the human brain and our experience and understand the, the more granular response and experience, right, as we, let's say, listen to a lecture or think about something that's very complex, um, those, that was a cognionic, which is a multiple points um, EEG without a need for uh, uh, Usually the, the trouble with those is you need contact for conductance, conductance, electrical conductance. So either you need a shaped head or you need a lot of um, you know, conductive liquids or paste to allow that to work. But that's, uh, I think new tech has provided ways to, to have it. So it is just you know, contact based um, rather than more, more of a gooey mess. And, and then I was wearing, I think Toby eye tracking glasses. Um, so I ended up with a photo that looked very futuristic, looked very, you know, um, almost Terminator-esque <laughs> with a bit of a red light at the bottom. So just love the, the framing of that. Um, 
and then to go back to yeah where where we're leading in in into this world of the future of work and, and i want to recognize work itself as a very capitalistic word right like it's obviously something that we tie to currency and value and production and and the squeezing of the human capital right the human being um I've been it's a nasty four-letter word it's a nasty very <laughs> nasty right. four-letter word and even the other word job is, is just another acronym uh, mm -hmm. acronym for just over broke so um <laughs> i love that they're neither yeah. of them are very good huge huge fan of acronyms and and thanks for sharing that yeah i i've been leaning to just saying doings because you know especially for those of us who work in um impact spaces and in spaces that are really thinking about you know justice thinking about um social good thinking about um more than human species right the environment our planet I don't think I want to categorize that as something that should be have a price tag or something that needs to be in competition or that's something that needs um, those those mentalities. And so to speak of not just, uh, you know, my doings or the future of doings itself, but also the current status of a lot of people in various corporations or small to medium sized businesses that are, you know, trapped in this current time um, based on on our constraints. Um, I think there just needs to be a lot more futuring and what we want that um, new way of working or new way of doing to, to look like. And there are a lot of people that I've read um, that I, and one that I will forever and always uplift and which a lot of my language com comes from as well is Brave New Work by Aaron Dignan. Um, he started The Ready, which is the consultancy side that, that does this work. And they've just launched an amazing platform called Murmur, um, which is also uh, by inspired as well, Murmur being kind of the reference to memorations of, of birds or other, um, you know, large schools of organisms that are able to maneuver and move without necessarily communicating based off of simple rules, just understanding, you know, an agreement with each other for the benefit of the good, right? Benefit of the entirety of that um, community, shall we call it. And so, they bring a lot of points on what does it mean to lean into work that is people positive, that is complexity conscious. And then personally, I, I added my own literation, which is life liberating, right? And I think all of these are so important and, and have a lot of facets to them um, to speak to, you know, for the people positive side. Yeah, how are we making sure we're taking care of ourselves? Going back to that sustainable ambition to understand that, you know, we're human, we have limitations, we have needs and desires. Um, how do we find that sweet spot in our agreements, in our values, in our operating principles to allow for that full human complexity, right? Um, and then going to what does it mean to be complexity conscious? Like, especially being in agile and nimble organizations or projects that have so many moving pieces and are answering complex problems themselves, you know, especially in environment and especially in social, social worlds. Um, it doesn't make sense to, to have something that's static or non-dynamic, right? And we have to move towards the ability to hold a lot more complexity, the ability to, um, yeah, going back to our, our love for systems thinking, like understand not just the, not necessarily understand, but, but have, have the flow and have the, the strategy that allows for emergence, right? I think, you know, another, you're going to hear me reference so many people in books and because they're, these are kind of the, the giants that I stand on the shoulder of and, and have also been hugely grateful to also share some space with. So um, Emergent Strategy by Adrian Marie Brown is another one that's drastically shifted my own view of what it means to um, yeah, take this systems perspective, but also understand it from a real human human being and where my role comes in. Um, and so there's a lot of principles there that really speak to me and, and to give it an example there is like, you know, moving at the speed of trust or um, there's always enough time for the right work. Right? I think we're as humans, there's this construct of time and there's what is enough. Um, and, and I love that framing because it's the question isn't where is the time going to come from? The question is, what is the right work for this time that we have? Um, and, and there's just a lot to speak to that. Um, 
and I can totally ramble, so feel free to to pause me or to interject. Um, I've kind of, I think, answered this question, maybe derailed it, but feel free to bring me back to, to the yeah, core of it. Do you, I mean, do you want, do you want to, did you have any uh, aha moments or moments where either of those either drew you into the depression because of what you're seeing with the the way the world was was going or because maybe technology was or maybe nature was and then uh, and, and the uh, severe uh. destruction and if not um that's okay as well did you use either of those to kind of pull yourself out or was it total disconnect and then going forward by speaking mm. to other friends and it was just a moment when you were you were clear or or or, or that that was kind of i just and if there wasn't that you don't have to address it i just wanted to uh, uh see if there was any learning lessons there yeah thanks for reframing that i i actually i love i love that prompt because it's it's both and i feel like I, both the tech because of the overexposure um to the rest of the world and what's happening in our world and obviously a big empath and I took a lot of that internally, so that definitely had an impact on my my own um, health and well-being. Um, nature, for sure, but it's more the disconnect, right? I was at home, I was, you know, locked in. I, I could have gone out, but I think there's this fear, you know, in my head, obviously, that I didn't want to risk um, my health, but also especially the the health of my parents, right? And so the disconnect from that, I think, also brought a lot of 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 tension and and um yeah put me in a in a not so great place but then on the flip side what kind of reconnected me and revitalized it's the same exact thing right kind of tech but tech being used in a mindful way like I, i've always said like instagram for me ig ig stands for you know there's a fine line between intentional generation and you know instant gratification and so utilizing ig as something that is an ego base for me wouldn't have been good, like seeing a lot of other lives um, do great things and compare it to myself, that just brings me even further down. But then if we frame it and utilize it as, like you're saying, a library as a way, and this is why I follow, as you've seen, like probably 3000 plus people or, or handles, is it's become a really wonderful funnel for me to, to follow the, the actual voices and generators um, of things that I love and, and uh, perspectives that I appreciate. And I think, you know, there's power in any kind of technology, but it all comes down to the agency, right? It's like, it all comes down to how we're using it, what's our relationship with it, you know, going back to right relations. And anything can be anything in the spectrum, and it's really the context, right? And, and for me, there's, there's a bit of a, uh, as I'm more mindful of this, like what is, what is not just the tech, but the, the creative and the art side to how I'm now curating my relationship with it. And that's an ongoing, oftentimes, you know, evolving optimization that I'm constantly tinkering with. And yeah, just, just very appreciative of both that. And then also just now that things are opening up, getting more access to the greater outdoors, I'm feeling more comfortable with that. Um, even though I definitely still appreciated the, the small, the small connections to nature, you know, the plants that are in my household or just in our yard and really um, sitting and listening and, and being with them. Um, I also watch the sunrise every morning. It's sort of a really anchoring uh, ritual for myself to tribute and honor and understand, you know, what is the core and the, the spawn of our, our world and, and to recognize we're constantly hurtling through time and space <laughs> um, and at high speeds and just fascinated by what it means to have both that that increase in velocity and acceleration, but also to have the stillness um, on the inside. So yeah, quick, quick wrap up to that, that question. Hopefully that gives you a better. Yeah, better yeah. Sense. no, that that's fine. I appreciate you going so deep. And um, there, there's two directions I want to go before we go there. Just, um, I believe you came. So although I love Singularity University, I do a lot, I know, Salim Ishmael, Peter Diamandis, Ray Kurzweil, many, many others. Um, 
they they ran into some trouble and it wasn't around diversity but it was around some other issues lost some funding and had some controversy in the news um and i'm not sure if that was before your time or not but you also were on the co-chair of diversity there and that was that after that time and did did you see a drastic change and and, and things uh, some of the problems i believe it was just one or two um professors there that had some issues at one time? Yeah, I mean, I've been connected to the specific issues and, and the fires necessarily. Um, I was a diversity inclusion equity movement, so DM, recognizing it's like a day-to-day -day thing, um, a daily practice. Um, I was a co-chair with two other wonderful women, um, Stacey Maldonado and Molly Pyle, great, great individuals, but we were also an employee resource group that wasn't necessarily funded or given a lot of uh, okay. uh, space and power to do um, much, even though we had influence and, and tried to uh, really shape the programs themselves. Um, and then a lot of the fiascos per se were sort of after my time. Um, I left in January 2020, which I think was also the result of a lot of just, uh, you know, wrong, wrong eggs in the wrong baskets, perhaps, or just yeah. a lot of decision making that didn't necessarily make sense um, for where we were at. So. Yeah. Okay. Kind of above, thank, thank, above yeah, it's it's not it's not even that important, but it's just kind of interesting because, and then yeah, you uh, the the uncommon lab and that there's there's a lot of beautiful things that uh, you've experienced, you've been part of, and and I really appreciate you sharing those. Um, it, it goes right into um, my next question for you, and it's really. Uh, um, Kind of we're, we're going to pull back and get into an overview effect a cosmic perspective and i, I want to know your thoughts on global citizenship global citizenry uh -huh. and maybe even if you want to tickle on global globalization but your thoughts and feelings on how do you feel about a world um, with humanity divided one from another, especially during this crazy time, this extreme nationalism that's uprised and occurred. And the, how would you feel if there was a world without nations and borders and divisions of humanity one from another? Uh, although you're a second generation American, you uh, are Taiwanese and, and um, have that tie there. I'm I'm American, but my my relatives are all German and English Irish, and I live in Hamburg, Germany. I I feel like I'm a global citizen. But the main thing is, is during the pandemic, the COVID was a global citizen. Food, water, air was a global citizen, and uh, species were a global citizen. And so I would just like to know your thoughts and feelings if. If there is something there that would maybe be, be if, if it wasn't there, the world would be a little better or what your thoughts and feelings are. Mm, yeah, appreciate this prompt. And also I recognize we dove in, so I didn't really do my usual introduction that I, that I generally like to, to introduce myself. And so I, I'd love to dive into that if we, we can. Um, and, and this is sort Please. of a, a practice that I think I've picked up from a lot of indigenous ways of introducing themselves as well, specific to, um, you know, shout out to Barbara Wall, um, Robin Wall Kimmerer's sister, who, who does a lot of wonderful studies, in, especially in the environmental space. Um, so, and basically, hello, friends, family, kin folks. I, and Leon Huang. Um, I go by the then Kikin pronouns. My parents are people from Taiwan, um, Taiwanese people. That is my blood. Um, and I'm currently tuning in from, I usually like to say, the unceded ancestral lands of the, that were once shared and stewarded by multiple tribes, actually. Um, the Gavilanio Tomba tribe, the Gish Nation, the Cahuila, and uh, Louisiana Indians. Um, and so when we introduce ourselves this way, it's not just who I am, but it's who I'm in relation with and who I hold responsibility to. And that changes, you know, whether I'm in different places or in different contexts, but this is sort of my current core identity of not just, you know, blood, but also land. I think those are two very important things. 
Um, but I also appreciate, you know, bonds of milk. So sort of bonds that we spend time with, you know, being queer, I think chosen family is, is just as important to the, the intentionalities we bring to our moments. Um, and yeah, kind of going back to this, what does it mean to be a citizen or to be part of a country or an identity um, bound by that kind of, of framing or uh, of, of, of different, different uh, nations and nationality. I think there's this, for sure, this ancestral root that I think no matter who we are, um, there's something to draw back from um, and even further beyond our own human species. And to me, global citizenship um, it's definitely something I identify with, which is why I have the United Nations flag in my profiles, uh, because I, I have to recognize where I grew up in my framing as American. Um, that's, I can't get away from that. That's sort of the systems and the, the thinking and the American dream, which really is an American nightmare that I was brought up on. Um, but wanting and yearning for much more, going back to the right relations, right? That we are all human and we all are part of life, right? So moving beyond that, not just um, kind of othering that I think nationhood provides to, to moving towards a sense of belonging, right? We're all, we're all here um, and we all want you know, our species to thrive and to flourish. And it currently isn't for, for many reasons. And I think nationhood or sort of this othering is a big part of that. Um, and especially to, you know, going off of, you know, population and, and human species, we are, you know, growing at such a fast exponential, whatever you want to call it, rate. Um, there's going to be a collapse. This is, this is time and time again, if you look at nature, you know, any, any species that has uh, taken over or dominated eventually has some sort of collapse. And I don't know how far we are away from that, but just seeing the limitations that we're hitting and seeing the reality for a lot of lived experiences, um, it's, it's kind of unfortunate and herring, right? I think we're, we're also um, giving, giving humanhood to corporations, which I also think is a fascinating thing, right? Like sometimes corporations and companies are more than human or more human than we are. And how do we balance that? Um, and so to hear you speak, you know, what does it mean to be of, of our globe, of, of Spaceship Earth, um, is I think what I personally lean towards and what I want. Um, I also love, you know, Bucky, Buckminster Fuller's quote that, you know, on Spaceship Earth, there are no passengers, we're all crew. Um, and so there's a bit of agency there, right? Like no one is a bystander, um, no part of nature or life is a bystander. And I think, the disconnect, the othering is what's causing a lot of that tension and especially othering from nature, right? Like the reason why we even have the term nature or have the term wild is that we've somehow separated the human from that when all along, you know, we could never, we've never left. We just don't think about it or connect or have the intentions as many of our elders had in the past. So that's kind of my, my framing of that. I absolutely love it. Thank you for sharing that. It's so important. And um, I really would like to know a little bit more of your, your, your learnings and your wisdoms from or what led you to Buckminster Fuller Institute, Bucky's Institute, and what you did there and, and what your experiences were, what, why, how, can tell us as much as you can about that. He was actually the second person to term uh, spaceship Earth and to kind of define that we're all crew members. The first person I have his book right here, one of his books right here, it's uh, uh, Kenneth Boulding. And he wrote the book, The Future. It's funny how <clears throat> um, I, 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 one of my many titles or ways that people describe me, they'll say Mark's a sustainable futurist or a resilient futurist or regenerative futurist, whatever. And what the hell does future have to do with environment or nat uh. naturalism or nature? And it's really crazy that how many people don't realize that 
It has everything to do with the future. It has to do, especially if you're going to reach the future, if you're sustainable and if you're thinking about that spaceship Earth and the environment, uh, because it processes you. He was the first person to term the 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 uh, coin the term, so to say, spaceship Earth, uh -huh. and and then Bucky was the second. But I I've always been fascinated. Ada per Paris is part of part of that as well, and many other of my friends are. Um, and colleagues that I see as mentors and, 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 and dear friends that are speaking about that. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that, if you don't mind. Yeah, it's actually a very recent um, engagement for me. It's only in the last you know, couple months since I've surfaced. Uh, I somehow, um, I think actually in Region Era Rising, which is when Ada Paris presented a lot of their, their projects from that cohort um, in that community, got connected into Buckminster Fuller Institute. And since then, I have been leaning into the project, which is the Cooperating Manual for Spaceship Earth. Um, and we'll share a link in, in, in the records. But this is sort of how do we think about, you know, because we are on, on the spaceship Earth and there needs to be a manual. There needs to be some way to understand what's going on, the whole rundown, but also the operating principles and how we're going to collaborate and really, you know, be stewards and, and be able to help steer um, uh, into the future, right? And I think when I, when I say future, there's also, I think there's also this tendency to think future far away, but as, exactly as, you know, some of the projects that you're working on, especially with evolving the sustainable development goals to be um, the resilient frontier, um, that's time bound, which I think is very important. The future isn't some place that we're never gonna see. It's actually, you know, much closer than any of us think. Um, I think there was, a wonderful quote that I came across from Reverend Gerard Williams um, that said, the future is your next breath. And I think when I heard that, it really hit um, just this concept of time that we, we are, are sitting in. So for me, uh, Buckminster, Mr. Buckminster Fuller Institute, um, that has been a really lovely experience to be sort of an advisory and helping shape that, that platform and that tool. Um, and how we're going to, to lean into that, that important doing. And then recently I've been a part of this current space camp. So the TremTab space camp that they run um, often. This one has been a wonderful experience because it's bringing in you know, expertise from Tom Chi, who um, was part of Google X, but now does a lot with that one ventures um, in the environmental space with uh, Jane Benyus, who was the one who coined uh, Vitamin McCree, and then with uh, Barbara Wall, as I mentioned before, um, and, and next week, I think we have Menace, uh, which is a, a lead in design. So it's been wonderful to be in community and space with these folks, but also be doing very specific, you know, missions that are time bound and how can we actually get something out there. So I, I'm co-leading a mission with Cassandra Huynh. Um, she's a wonderful bio designer, actually based in Berlin and in Potsdam, just a little outside of Berlin in Germany. And uh, yeah, we're looking at what we call future playground. And, and what that means is um, this perspective, of, you know, not just working hard and playing hard, but how do we revert that, invert that to be play soft and work softer and to recognize the, the importance of, you know, letting our inner child be part of a lot of this, going back to the space of creativity, of um, even a bit of naiveness, because I think that's where, you know, when I see, you know, the youth in my life, they're just so curious and, and they don't have any preconceived notions to hold them back. And so the dreaming and the knowing that they can do is, is just something that's beautiful that I think needs to be tapped into um, across the board when we speak about intergenerational uh, learning and doing. And yeah, we're excited to, to unveil that in the near future. I think um, that's all around. We're focusing on oceans rising. So looking at sea level rising and, and how do we really bring in narratives and um, inclusivity and participatory design to share those stories, but also to, to galvanize some, some actions. And uh, I think that's going to be very exciting and, and yeah, keep an eye out for, for where that goes. That's beautiful. I really appreciate you um, telling tell me about that. And, and it, it's really interesting with the oceans as well. Um, Yesterday, I had a podcast with uh, two absolutely amazing, wonderful uh, authors of, of a 
a, a book with three authors, actually. It's called A Blueprint for Coastal Adaptations. Uh, and it and involves all facets. It's an island press publication and it, and it um, really comes uh, at a timely time. It was just barely released uh, uh, this okay. month. And it's uniting design, economics, and policy around a blueprint for coastal adaptation. And I had a discussion with them about this book is specifically focused on the United States, although we know that uh, coastal adaptation and those uh, around the uh -huh. world are really affected. But how much it really affects the United States and, and uh, is unbelievable and how many places in the United States are being uh, affected in big ways. And then next week, I have a podcast with um, Lawrence Krauss, he wrote the book, The Physics of Climate Change. And I'll tell you more, not only does he start out the book and end the book with a sea level rising uh, based upon his time and tour in Vietnam uh -huh. on the Mekong River, but pretty much half of the book is talking about sea level rise and issues with the oceans and riverways or waterways and things. So uh, you're definitely in the right project. You're doing the right things. And um, I, I absolutely love that. Um, you, you tickled upon it a little bit. Um, uh, there's going to be a collapse. You see, you didn't so, say when, but just that's how our world works. There's going to be a collapse, especially with population. You kind of caveated it with that. There is this growing besides the pandemic, even before the pandemic, I think it made it worse during all the things we've experienced since this dis-ease or this unrest in humanity where we've kind of felt like, oh, I'm just uncomfortable. I'm not, I don't like the way things are going, no matter where yeah. you live, people are saying that. Uh, and there's, you know, and I, I don't want to put words in people's mouth, but is, is it a feeling of a collapse or a, a looming extinction? Um, and the question is, how do you feel that our current civilization frameworks are working for you? The United States and the globe, Europe, uh, uh, Taiwan, China, where, wherever you think there are civilization frameworks that influence you and your life. And do you believe we're about ready or due for some new civilization frameworks or a new civilization framework? Yeah, no, 100%. We are due for so many reworks and so many, um, not even just reworks, I think just honestly, I'd love to just put it aside and start something new because that is a lot easier and a lot less tension and friction. Um, than to dismantle something, which is what we're witnessing, you know, especially for the social social unrest and the, the justice work and um, really the marathon that has been happening since the, the start of our own nation and many others speaking from a colonial perspective, right? I think that's, that's a history that we're gonna have to bear and, and have to um, process, especially the trauma around. And speaking of, you know, civilizations, I've always loved Tyson Yocaporta um, and, and his, his book, Sand Talk, you know, how indigenous thinking can save the world and framing that, yeah, our, our, our cities, our nations are designed for growth, which is, you know, endless, infinite growth and in a, in a finite planet will not work. Um, but from his, his suggestion and, and, you know, as a solution of that is, is designing not for growth, but for, for increase, right? For, if we think about a, the value of a dollar, getting more dollars gets you more dollars. But when you have the dollar change hands, that kind of value is experienced you know, within a system. And so when I think about increase, I think about you know, forests, you know, thinking about the, the wood wide web underneath, how interconnected things are, how does that look in, in resource and material exchange and usage? Um, I think we, as nations and as corporations, you know, we are we are more we the corporations than we are we the people, um, or even we we the whatever the life or the kin that you might want to, to reference, right? I think there is a need to recognize a lot of this has been creating, you know, caste has been creating a lot of 
inequality and a lot of detriment and, and trauma um, across the board. And so who do we look to, uh, whether it's indigenous leaders and indigenous wisdom, which communities have been necessarily thriving because of the genocide and because of the, the othering, but have held to a lot of principles that speak to what does it mean to be stewards or um, a true, true custodial species on this planet. Um, what does it mean to look to nations like Taiwan that is in a very precarious situation, you know, with, with the colonizer, especially China, um, with a lot of governmental tensions, um, but is, is experimenting so much in democracy. I mean, you, you've heard it from Audrey Tang herself, and he's been doing wonderful, wonderful work in, in iterating and creating systems that allow for that kind of deep, deep democracy. And those are conversations that I think are super important, but those conversations need to also translate into actual actions and, and regulations and policy. And that's a world that legally the world just moves too slow, right? And so how are we gonna get to that, that um, future is, is always a question on my mind for sure, yeah. I appreciate you answering that. And <clears throat> sometimes I get into this feeling that a lot of humanity have forgotten that there have been more than 20 civilization frameworks that have existed on our planet before early antiquity, early Mesopotamia, Incas, Aztecs, Mayas, Greeks, the Romans, on and on. And uh, they're no longer here. They're gone. And those were all collapses, all but 20 of them, uh, all but two of the 20 civilization frameworks we had collapsed because of an environmental or ecological collapse. And uh, only two of them um, aren't here because of other reasons. And it, it's really interesting um, how, how I, I mean, I kind of feel a lot of people have forgotten about it. Matter of fact, in the book I just mentioned from Lawrence Krauss, uh, The Physics of Climate Change, um, he just basically goes and talks about the, the sheer physics. It's basic, very basic physics and, uh, and go uh, as science and, and, and very simple math in, in there as well. So it's not very hard to grasp, but he says, 98% of humanity is disengaged from climate. That means there's 2% in this bubble or who are engaged, but yeah. we're almost preaching to the choir. And, but I get this feeling and I want, and I'm kind of asking you, not that uh, you necessarily have your, your finger on the pulse of, of, of the, uh, I'm not even sure. Are you a millennial or are you even a step below millennial? I think the step Gen below generation Y. Gen, I Gen X, my... Gen Y. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I was born in 1992. Um, and and, and what, what, I mean, just in your circles or what you've experienced, I mean, do you feel that that is common knowledge that that, that we get in history, the big history, so to say? Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to say I'm also in a bubble, right? I'm in, I'm in an echo chamber of and of itself because of my networks and communities that I spend the most time with. And, and I do recognize, I agree with you, that the general larger public, especially of the entire world, so especially thinking about people in the global majority that don't have access to even technology or access to some of the privileges that we do, we can't even expect them to have that education or literacy, you know, especially for, for um, sustainable development or regenerative goals in the future. So to speak to that, I think um, this is why it's so important to have our artists, to have our creative people that are doing a lot of this storytelling and a lot of the meaning making that then leads to the self-actualization of others, right? Like, this is why I love Sustainable Ocean Alliance because they're also focusing on, you know, a lot of youth. We have programs um, and, and hubs all around the world in different countries and projects in those localities and a lot of micro-grants that support that um, which is all about galvanizing you know, a future generation that can not just speak to this, but do things about it. Um, and hopefully in a timeline that isn't too late, right? And I think that's, that's the, the beauty of you know, creating a next gen that um, 
is much more aware and, and witnessing kind of the millennials and a lot of the, the tech that is being utilized that way, right? Like again, going back to agency, there's a lot of climate activists. There are a lot of youth that are really, um, really rising up and, and saying enough is enough. And, and part of that is the, the tension against the corporations and the, the, the generations that are holding the, the current status quo. Um, and part of that is, you know, developing new, new thinking, new systems, new communities, new language, even of how we're going to, to future, um, how we're going to lean in and move into that future, right? Kind of thinking of it as like shining a flashlight and figuring out, you know, what's probable, what's plausible, and 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 what's possible, and and really leaning into um, the 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 decisive factors that we can have a locus of control around. You believe that there's a plan, an earth shot, a climate shot, or a moon shot uh, to get us uh, safely to 2030. You know I'm a sustainable development goal advocate, so that, that's my moon shot, my earth shot. Um, mm. But I mean, for you specifically, it, it, is it donut economics? Is it circular economy? Is it regenerative? economics yeah. is it one of those or it, it do you believe that there's a specific global plan for you and, and what is it oh what's your opinion on that yeah that's a hard one to answer because there's so much and obviously in a complex challenge and complex world to, to dive into but to speak for myself i think what i'm trying to put my own language around is you know speaking to the japanese term ikigai or like the reason for being um what that's looked like for me is in this interstitial space, right? Like, how do I, how do I, how do I work or do um, or be in such a way that I'm weaving in between? I know Ada Paris in her her interview referenced Claude Debussy. The the music is the silence between the notes, and I love that image because we're talking about the nodes and the notes that we're so familiar with. But who's looking at the silence? Who's weaving? Who's um, surfacing these threads and connections? And if I could wave my wand. I would want everyone to really feel and know and have those conduits to, you know, I've been terming as a, a brighter or brighter future, right? So sort of the B in parentheses referencing, you know, we, we, we need to speak to the Jedi perspective. We need to speak to a brighter future, but it's also not just for humans, it's for, for all life, right? And, and what does that conversation look like? How do we even begin to, to talk about that? Um, you know, recognizing the limitations of science to understand the language of other species, or even even our limitations of understanding the language of others. Right? I think um, it's it's a the language, the the connection, the right relations. That's I think where my love is, and which is probably why I'm an extreme generalist, kind of dancing in between all these systems and communities, um, and and also being sort of free agent to a way the way that Tyson Yukonporter describes it as being that free agent that is creating and weaving and, and generating a lot more increase in our systems, right? Like pushing these resources and pushing these connections and, and seeing how that then will um, evolve. Because honestly, there's, there's no way to guarantee anything. Anything can happen day to day, moment to moment, um, especially from a climate and especially from a uh, uh, cosmolic, like cosmo perspective, right? Like, we, we just don't know. Um, and so I think for me, the core is speaking to systems that are more resilient, systems that do have that um, regenerative perspective. And again, you know, there's a lot there and there's a lot of weight there. And so going back to the sustainable ambition is thinking about what is each of our you know, unique role in that? Because there is no other you, right? Like we um, can't uh, forsake any, any person, any life, and, and the value that they can bring to this larger, yeah, intention and larger wish, larger dream for, for our planet. So yeah, I just want to end with that, that note. I'm, I'm glad you did. That's great. So I've, I'm going to deliver you the, the hardest question I have for you today, which is the burning Love question. It. You've listened to the podcast before, so you've heard it. It's the burning question, WTF. It's not the swear word, but it's what's the future? And I would like to know specifically for you, what's your roadmap? What's the future? Mm, yeah, so more like what's my journey ahead? What's on the horizon? Or what am I dreaming into the future? 
Well, I mean, uh, I always like when, when you know, it, it's almost like Simon Sinek's why or your purpose for existing or what, yeah. what's your roadmap and how, how are you going or how have you set up your plan to assuredly get, get to a certain point in the future? What does it lo- look like? And um, whether it's your own prediction, but uh, or also maybe your, your map and mission to, to get to that point. Uh, I also, I also like the fact that if, if you say, well, I'm going to be dramatically optimistic or extremely optimistic. And it's, I, I'm really hoping or wishing, desiring this happens. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I definitely, I definitely do identify with having a lot of relentless optimism myself. Um, and then going back to the extreme generalist point, I would say for me, um, I've always been thinking about that that role and that roadmap for myself. It used to be wanting to be a keystone species. And so that would be you know, someone who in all communities or ecosystems or systems that I'm a part of, I have disproportional impact. But I recognize that also means if I'm incapacitated or if I'm no longer in that system, that system collapses. And so that turned out to be not a great metaphor of how I wanna show up in spaces. Uh, even though I really appreciated the terminology. And now I've kind of moved on to a different uh, being geeky sort of a physics perspective. I call myself a catalyzing connector. And what that means to me um, is is really curating the space and creating the conditions that reactions can happen and um, happen in a way that doesn't you know completely drain me. And so what that looks like has been leaning into being more of an advisor than just an, uh, a specific supporter or something or uh, connecting people and letting them take that magic further because there's so many people, like you said, that need to be connected to ideas or um, wonderful humans or communities or um, resources going back to the library of earth uh, that would really change their lives and change the way that they're able to impact our world. So I see myself now as like being and leaning into that side of the, the world. And then a friend came up on my chair and was like, you know, there's this term called autocatalysis in chemistry, right? Which is a catalyzer in this reaction that then creates other catalyzers. And so I've kind of taken on that in addition to think in everything that I'm a part of, um, how do I become that auto catalyst? How do I create conditions and, and support others and uplift others going back to this, like climbing that mountain and lifting others as I go? Um, how do I create catalysts in them so that they can then uh, uh, spread this, this intentionality further? And I guess what I would wish for the world is just, yeah, more, more empathy, more right relations. I think if we have that, that is the basis to which a lot of, a lot of flourishing, a lot of thriving will come from, um, which is just to say, yeah, going back to how to have right relationships with ourselves, you know, first and foremost, right relationships with each other, and then right relationships with our world, our nature, right? Um, there might be more beyond that transcendence, whatever it could be. Um, I haven't gotten there yet, but if anyone anyone wants to add more levels to that, I'm, I'm totally, totally open and all ears. So, so yeah, at me. <laughs> I really want to know, and this is for the listeners, if there was one message you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? Hmm. Yeah, this is a hard one somehow. I'm like, now that now that I've listened to it and I, I'm a, a high person for so many other words and languages um, of wisdom from, from the people that I, I read and look up to and in a community with. But yeah, my own phrase, what would I say? Yeah, it, it's even totally fine if you use someone else's words that you like. I actually let me let me bring up. Um, I was kind of being. I love puns, obviously, and I also love Gandhi. Um, and and everyone has heard of Gandhi's quote: "Be the change you want to see in the world." Um, 
but even that I think is, is attributed wrong because there's a much larger quote of where that comes from. Um, but I, I took that for Sustainable Ocean Alliance because we're always in the in the doings of inventing new new framing and language that is ocean funny. So like instead of low hanging fruit, I like to say high floating kelp, or like instead of hitting the ground running, we we hit the ocean diving. Um, and so I guess the message that I I would say is yeah. Do we the, the change you want to see in the world? <laughs> what does it mean to be the anchor and to be sort of the, the, the waypoint um, for others? Um, being part of uh, currents, you know, speaking to ocean terms and really why this has been my background for the last several months is there's, you know, Finding Nemo had so many lovely motifs and stories about going, finding new, finding friends, finding people that we belong to and trying to go back home. Um, what does it mean to go back to your home? Where, where are your roots? I think that's always a wonderful question for any of us to ponder and really learn about, um, which never really ends, right? I think speaking to Robin Wall Kimmerer's words, I love the perspective that, you know, time isn't linear and time is almost a cycle or is ever present. And so that means our ancestors are not just behind us, but are also ahead of us and also with us. And so what does it mean to tap into some of that? Um, and to, to experience and access, you know, time, wisdom, uh, intentions, roots, kind of this, this actual love that, I, that I've been feeling so much of recently, um, and generate that into, into your own self-actualization and change. I think that's probably the, the message I would want to leave right now. So there, there was this wonderful website that you shared with me and also this emergence um, it's for a while, but I, but I don't think we've seen it too much in the digital realm uh, or over the years, but it's intersectional environmentalism. <clears throat> lovely website, lovely purpose. Um, do you... Can you tell us any more about that? Or are you affiliated with them? Are you an advisor for them? Do you just are supporting them? Um, yeah, are, not are, you an inter, are, are you an intersectional environmentalist? Yeah, uh, thank you for asking. I'm not officially affiliated with them at the moment. Um, I did have conversations with Leah P. Thomas, who is the one who uh, galvanized that movement when she, I think, um, something like July last year, um, launched this messaging around, you know, we, we can't have uh, environmental movements without actually talking about social justice. And it's not just planet, but people and planet. Um, and so that, that sort of pledge really drew me in. And since then I've been a big, big supporter of this. And for sure, I call myself an intersectional environmentalist, obviously being, being of many, many different identities um, and facets, you know, whether it's whether it's queer, or whether it's um, Asian and Taiwanese, whether it's uh, gender queer, um, there's just so much I think to recognize um, in that deeply connected. Like we can't separate that people and planet, right? There, there needs to be an intentionality of both, and there needs to be a reckoning of the current systems of oppression and how we're operating. Um, and really level the playing field, which is why I love like, you know, a lot of more movements recently, you know, speaking of like Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson and all that we can save, um, so much beautiful, beautiful work um, and anthology and, and, and again, lifting of, of beautiful, amazing um, women that have been doing a lot of this climate work um, that just isn't mentioned or talked about enough of. And so again, yeah, what other, what other unknown unknowns are we not surfacing because of our current systems of oppression? And um, being, speaking to that like ABAR, anti-bias, anti-racist perspective, it's, it's an ever-present, never-ending journey, right? I think it's a day-to-day -day thing. Um, I'm not perfect. I don't think I ever will be. And, and it's really going back to the intentionality and real unlearning, right? Like not just learning, but unlearning what we've been taught, what we've been instilled as, um, what kind of water we're breathing in in this moment, right? And, and not just recognizing it, but actually doing something about it is, is the most important thing, right? Going back to the actualization, the manifesting, um, 
Yeah. I believe you're still on your journey. You're still discovering, making connections, building your network, uh, growing quite a bit. And I'd love that you shared so much of that with, with us. What have you experienced or learned in your journey so far, professional and non-professional, that you would really have loved to know from the beginning where you say, boy, I, I would have started sooner. Boy, I wish I knew that. Is, is there anything? I think part of it is, is not, not limiting myself. I think we're, we're taught to respect or um, understand hierarchy and we're taught to uh, hide parts of ourselves that we that apparently shouldn't be in certain spaces, whether it's professional or work. And I think there is such power and beauty in just being fully authentic and fully ourselves. Um, and, and even for me, that is a constant journey, you know, being positive for 26 years, that's often left a very clear marker of how I show up in spaces. Um, and there's a lot of learning for myself to do there. But if I were to go back and, and share with myself and share with anyone that's listening right now, um, yeah, don't. Don't let any, any external othering, any system um, prevent you from, from being authentic. And it's, it's, it's a travesty that our workspaces or workplaces um, don't allow for that, right? And, and if I could wish for that is that we do have more and more leaning into that brave new work that again, is people positive. And what does that actually look and mean and, and sound and feel like? Um, but from a personal perspective, that's a hard one to get over. And the sooner, you know, each of us learn that lesson and kind of let go of that ego, honestly, the better, right? So. Leon, it's been a sheer pleasure. I really thank you for being on the show. It's been uh, wonderful. And I love the depth and, and all, all that you've shared with us today. That's all I have for you today. And I, I hope we can do a catch up maybe in a year again. And see how how your life's going how the journey's going I, I, yeah. i'm sure you're going to have amazing updates um <laughs> but I, but i thank you for being on the show it's been a pleasure yeah thank you so much mark for for the conversation this last last um hour and a half and just yeah for creating creating this platform for others to tap into many voices many ideas um it's it's such a beautiful thing to be uplifting others and also recognize you yourself have been doing so much and, and just also want to just wish you know gentle care and, and radical rest and, and filling your own vessel that you so generously spill for others um, in our world. So grateful for you, grateful to everyone who's listening to this across deep time. Um, please, yeah, reach out, connect, do feel free to, to knock on the door or open a portal. Always happy to, to connect and catalyze um, yeah, important intentions and impact for, for all of our Shambhala warriors, shall we say, out there. Thank you so much. And you really, you've, you've filled my cup. You've actually given me that, what, what I need and seek uh, uh, so much that uh, keeps me going and, and luckily I've been very fortunate um, to have some wonderful guests on that also bring mm. that nice exchange so I thank you and you have a wonderful day give those wonderful parent parents of your here's a big hug and uh, unknown hello for me and uh, <laughs> we'll talk to you again very soon T take care Leon yeah thank you so much bye, -bye. bye for now Mark <laughs>